Four weeks from midterm election day, voters will decide the balance of power in Washington. And one of the most closely watched congressional races in the country is the one to represent the 8th District of Michigan. It's the incumbent Republican Mike Bishop being challenged by Democrat Alyssa Slotka. They're both here today, face to face. Today is Sunday, October 7th, 2018, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. We're going to get right to the matter today so that we can devote every second to my two guests this morning. They are the centerpieces of, as I mentioned, one of the most closely followed races in the nation. The 8th District of Michigan has been represented by Republican Mike Bishop. He is seeking his third term in that seat, being challenged this time around by a Michigan native who spent the last 15 years in the U.S. intelligence and military communities, Alyssa Slotka. I'm so grateful to both of you for uh, accepting our invitation to be here, especially in a non-formal uh, debate format, but really more of a conversation conversation. Mm -hmm. And Congressman, I'll start with you uh, as we get our conversation going. I read something recently. Congratulations, I guess, are in order. You both are in the top 10 in the country for the amount of money that is being spent against you, a race that looks like it's headed toward maybe $15 million between the two of you. And I guess my question is, with Americans widely reviling Congress, mm -hmm. it's become synonymous with futility and waste. Uh, and given the hatred and the vitriol we see in the American conversation right now, why do you want to be in Congress? <laughs> Look, I, I was born and raised in this district. Uh, my family uh, and I, I have been there for years, uh, going back many generations. I love my country, and I do this out of love of country, and I will continue to do this. I think it's important for all of us to stand up and be a part of the future of our country and stand up to uh, some of the bullying that's going on in this country right now. And I'm not going to be chased out of this district by Nancy Pelosi or anybody uh, who wants to, you know, do a classic Washington, D.C. power grab. I'm going to stand up to it. I'm going to fight for it. I believe in our founding principles and our founding fathers. I believe our Constitution is something to fight for, and I'm going to continue to do that. Now, Ms. Lockin, you've been around the political scene because you've had uh, appointed jobs. You've been a part of a couple of administrations, but this is your first move into politics itself. Yeah. Why do you want to be a part of this mess? Yeah, I get asked that a lot, actually, because everywhere I go in the district, people are telling me, you know what, the system's corrupt, both parties are broken, I'm not going to vote. And as a national security person, I spent 14 years in national security working for both Democrats and Republicans. That scares me, that people are bowing out of our democratic system. I think we just need a new generation that thinks differently, that works harder, and remembers that they are public servants. I think people have forgotten that their job is to make the lives of their constituents better. Um, and I believe the only way that we're going to fix it is if a new generation comes in on both sides of the aisle. So I'm, I'm, I think it's worth fighting for. Um, we're in a service family. My husband's 30 years in the Army. It's, it's what we believe in. It's our country. Well, let's start with this then, which is that uh, often midterm elections are seen as a referendum on uh, the occupant of the White House. A lot of people see this as a referendum on Donald Trump. I'd like you to uh, assess the Donald Trump presidency for me. He's done some things that a lot of Democrats have been asking for for years when it comes to trade, uh, yeah. and yet he's done some things that uh, obviously probably <laughs> rankle a lot of Democrats. What's your assessment of the presidency yeah. so far? I mean, I think that um, leadership climate is set from the top and the leadership climate that, been, that has been set um, is a tone and tenor of vitriol um, that is unbecoming of the country that I served in the country that we all love. Um, and I think that it's the responsibility of anyone who's in leadership to hold themselves to a higher standard of integrity and set a positive tone. You know, I have a, I have a ton of people who are supporting our campaign, frankly, who are Republicans, who will say, I just, this isn't how I raise my kids. It's not how I want my, my, I learned in church. This is just not how we are meant to be as a country. We can do great things when we work together, but he's splitting people apart. Congressman, your assessment of the Trump presidency these first two years. Well, I'm interested in that, uh, in that, um um, re, uh, uh, critique of, of the president because it's exactly what my opponent's been doing is spending millions of dollars, Washington, D.C. Washington, dollars, Hollywood dollars against me with nothing but vitriol and incivility. And I can tell you that there are times when I disagree with the president. There are times when I agree with the president and I know uh, how to approach it. I think the economy is going great right now. I think. One of the that, times that you've disagreed with the president, if I can ask. Oh, on usually Michigan issues, uh, uh, I've had a chance to interact with the the administration with regard to trade, with regard to tariffs, with regard to the Great Lakes. As you know, the executive budget boxed out the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. That's important to me. It's important to my family. It's not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's something that's important to all of us. 
So we fought to get that funding back into the budget. And that's something that we had to take on the, the executive branch to do. So you don't always get along with it. One of the great things is, because of the Constitution, this is a separate but equal branch of government. My yeah. responsibility is to oversee the executive branch, and that's what I do. Uh, he mentioned the tariffs. I'd like us to, to talk about trade policy and what that's meant for Michigan. Uh, Jim Hackett at Ford recently said that uh, the trade, the steel uh, tariffs uh, have cost Ford a billion dollars. Yeah. Um, Mary Buckziger is a local uh, lifelong Republican auto supplier who believes that these tariffs may run her right out of business. What are your thoughts on the tariffs? Yeah, I mean, listen, war? no, I don't think anyone disagrees that China is cheating in the global system, right? So the sentiment makes sense, but you can't have the cure for the disease be worse than the disease itself. Um, and if it's punishing middle class to, you know, voters, if it's <clears throat> punishing our auto industry, our farmers, I live on a soybean farm, <laughs> that it just doesn't make sense for us and you have to stand up and say something about that. So, um, you know, but on other things, listen, you call a spade a spade. It looks like the deal that we have on NAFTA right now is positive, right, if the details bear out. Um, but, you know, I think everyone agrees China is playing unfairly in the system, but the, the, the cure cannot be worse than the disease. Have you made your uh, um, frustrations with the tariffs known at the White House? Absolutely. In fact, I was in the White House uh, when he returned home from Helsinki and had a chance to be in a roundtable discussion actually about tax reform. But in that conversation, I had a chance to talk to him about tariffs and trade and let him know how important it is <coughs> to the state of Michigan. It's, uh, it's unique. We, we live in a peninsula. It's not just our manufacturing but it's also our, our farmers who are living paycheck to paycheck and we got to make sure we, we protect them. Um, we solicited uh, some questions from some of our viewers and uh, many of them sort of go into the questions I'm asking. I wanted to ask one of them verbatim. Uh, Michael Nagy said, I want to hear their detailed views on gun rights, including ownership of handguns, rifles, assault weapons, large capacity magazines and concealed carry, not just this I support the Second Amendment nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Locke, why don't you sure. start? So I grew up in a gun-owning family. I grew up on a, you know, we have a family farm. Um, when I was trained to go to Iraq, I was trained in a Glock and an M4 um, and carried a weapon out there. My husband was, you know, 30 years in the Army, carried a weapon every day he was deployed. So I am a big believer in the Second Amendment. But it's because of that background that I believe we need to have an honest conversation about gun safety. And I think the area where we have common ground is universal background checks and closing all the loopholes so that mentally ill people domestic abusers, terrorists on the watch list, can't buy a gun in our country. Um, it's the same kind of background check that I went through before the CIA would ever put me in weapons training, same background check that went, my husband went through before he was put on the range as an army officer. Um, and I think that's where we have common ground. If I uh, can pass all those background checks, should I be able to own a, a, an assault weapon or a, and a high capacity magazine to go with it? Yeah, so I don't think, you know, as someone who carried an M4, that you ha we should be able to sell material that turns any weapon into a fully automatic weapon, right? So bump stocks, certain types of trigger mechanisms, ex extended magazines, I just don't know that we need to sell them here in our country until we have a, a strong conversation about how we're going to protect our kids in schools. Congressman Bishop, your thoughts on what, what, is, <clears throat> what amounts to common sense gun law to you? Well, in, in um, you know, I do support the Second Amendment and I have, uh, I, I think it's important to have an honest and open discussion about this. I have been working with the uh, School Safety Caucus to talk about ways that we can work together in a bipartisan way to bring forward uh, common sense solutions for our schools to allow our school districts to harden their systems to protect students. I have three kids of my own. It's something that I think about all the time. I'm not afraid to take on my own, my own party. I supported the repeal of the, the bump stock because I saw what happened after, after the uh, horrible incident in Las Vegas that we have to do something about it. Absolutely, you have to make sure that whomever owns a weapon, as I do, that they're responsible and they're trained. And we have to make sure that that uh, is part of, you know, the, the, um, the ethics of, of holding a, a gun and, and um, having the right to use should it. Should we be arming teachers? <clears throat> I don't think you should put the guns in the hand of anybody who doesn't want to have it. I don't think you should put the guns in the hand of anybody who's not trained to use it. I don't think that's the solution, but I do think that every school district and every local unit of government needs to have those kind of resources to do what they need to do in their district. Same question. Should we arm teachers? No. I mean, I think that uh, the teachers I've talked to have said the day that I'm forced to carry a gun is the day I retire as a teacher. Um, and I can't think of something more dangerous than putting the hand, you know, in the hands of someone who don't wants to, doesn't want to be holding a weapon, um, forcing them to take a weapon. I want to move to one more topic before we have to get to a break, mm -hmm. and that's immigration. <clears throat> Should there be a wall on our southern border? 
A wall is not, when you say wall, you suggest that it's a structure across. What we need is a secure border. There are places along our border that have a unique spot for a wall, but there is technology that would allow us to create a barrier that is equal to a wall, and I think we need to invest in that. I, you know, when I hear wall, I understand what people are saying. We need to secure our borders to ensure that we have proper immigration, to ensure that we don't have a direct flow of drugs and, and trade of, of slave tra uh, traffic back and forth uh, uh, with human beings. I think we have to do whatever we can to secure our borders. Should ICE be a part of that? Absolutely, ICE is an important part of what we do. And you know, uh, the, the counter solution would be to have no, no uh, borders at all, or uh, like uh, my opponent's party has proposed, get rid of ICE and uh, support sanctuary cities. And that's not common sense. Um. I don't have the opponent's party here, but I have your opponent here. Yep, <laughs> what, are, yes. what are your thoughts? His opponent on, can speak for herself, <clears throat> and, and I think it's just wall? it's just another example, um, just to respond to where I am a different person than this sort of stereotype that Mr. Bishop likes to put out there of every Democrat, whether he's talking about. Pelosi, whether he's talking about my party. Um, as someone who served her country, let me say unequivocally that I believe ICE should exist and should continue to fill out, f to carry out its mandate, just like any other uh, service and border force should. Um, and uh, we're not all the same. We're very different people, and uh, as much as he'd like it to be the opposite. In terms of immigration, listen, the system is broken, right? We can be clear on that. And immigration is a national security issue. It is an economic issue and it's a moral issue, right? I served my entire life trying to protect this, this country from uh, attacks, homeland attacks. So I feel very strongly that we need to enhance security at our borders. <clears throat> Does um, that mean a wall? I, I don't believe a wall makes sense, but more technology and more border agents, yes. Uh, when we come back, I'm going to let you, but we talked about some of the vitriol in the campaign. I'm going to let you both respond to ads that have been running against you both and see what you have to say about that as we continue this conversation with Alyssa Slotkin and Mike Bishop. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.